Imagine you have a video and you want to do some video analysis on it. It might be a video of cars driving up and down the road and you want to count how many of them have passed your house. It might be soccer players and you want to see how far each player is running in a particular soccer match. One of the tools that can help you with this is called object tracking, which is exactly what we're going to talk about today. One of the most iconic pieces of data in computer vision history is the Oxford Town Center video. It's simply a video with people walking up and down the street and we'll use it here as our testing video. So let's start at the beginning. What we're looking for here is to follow these people over time. So we want to be able to detect their location in the image as well as knowing where that same person was in the previous frames. Now to tackle the problem of finding the locations of the people in the frame, there are a lot of different machine learning models that can localize different kinds of objects in a specific image. These models are called object detectors. In our case, the object we're looking for here is a person. Usually, the output of one of these object detection models is a bounding box around the object. The box is also associated with the class and the score. The class saying what type of object it is and the score of how certain the model is that its prediction is correct. Now with video though, we have an additional component, time. When the video is playing, the people in the video move from one frame to another. If we take the first, 10th, 20th and 30th frames of the town center video, we can clearly see the difference. Just look at the man and the woman in the bottom left of each frame. Now imagine we were to run an object detection algorithm that was trained to detect people on each of these frames. Its output would look something like this. Assuming our object detector is always correct, we now have the location of each person in every frame of the video. Comparing these images to each other when they're displayed this way though is a bit hard. So let's merge these four frames onto each other so we can start to see the patterns over time. We however, as humans, know instinctively that the four boxes in the middle belong to the same person. The man with the bike. But for a computer it's not that easy. So the main question remains, when we have multiple frames with the same objects but in slightly different places, how can we keep track of which box in one frame belongs to the same object as that other box in the next frame? This problem is called multi-object tracking. This is different from single object tracking, which looks at how best to keep track of a specific object regardless of other bounding boxes. We're going to focus on multi-object tracking here since it's the most likely one you'll be using. All right. Everyone still following? As a recap, ideally we would be able to chain these boxes together so our code knows that they belong to the same person. So let's now take a look at how multiple object tracking is done in the real world. But first, we have to start with the concept of intersection over union, or IOU for short. This is a number that represents how much two bounding boxes overlap. And just like the name suggests, it is calculated by taking the intersection of the two bounding boxes and dividing it by the union of them. So as you can see here, the IOU is a metric between 0 and 1. That represents the overlap between the two bounding boxes. This means the IOU becomes 0 when the boxes don't overlap at all and grows the more of its surface area is overlapping with the other bounding box. Of course it becomes 1 when the two boxes are in the exact same position and have the exact same size. The IOU is simple, but it still plays an important role in even the most recent trackers. Alright, now that we know how IOU works, we can actually use it to create a basic tracker. Let's run our imaginary object detector on our first frame here. It's quite a lot of banning boxes, so let's just focus on the man with the bike and the lady in red at first. At this moment we don't have enough information yet to make a track. We only have one detection for each of our persons. But when we go to the next frame, we run our object detector again and now we do have enough information. If we calculate the IOU between all of the boxes from this frame and all of the boxes from the previous frame, we can already see that just by taking the box with the highest IOU, it's enough to get the correct boxes assigned. But in the case of Our Lady in Red, there were actually two overlapping bounding boxes. But in that case, we simply take the one with the highest IOU. 
If we then assign the same color to detections that we think that belong to the same person, we can keep track of what detections belong to each other. In other words, they belong to the same track. Of course, now it's only a matter of doing it for every next frame. So we do the same thing for the third frame, the same thing for the fourth frame, and so on. But we're only four frames in now, and it already looks like a mess. So most of the time, we just keep track of the middle points of the previous boxes and connect them with a line. That just gives everyone a trajectory that we can more easily work with. So now we've built our first basic, quite decent, multi-object tracker using nothing but IOU. But it has no idea how to deal with the two most prominent tracking issues, namely missing detections and occlusion. Now, missing detections, they're quite obvious. Even the most insanely large object detector models make mistakes. And in fact, in real-world applications, usually you'll find a much smaller, more efficient model to lower costs or computing time. So a good tracker will have to be able to deal with that. Now, next to that, there's the problem of occlusion. This happens when a person is only partly visible, or not even visible at all, for one or more frames. Let's take this woman as an example. In multiple cases, she was walking behind other people, making it hard or even impossible for the detector to find her. But when she comes back into view and the detector picks her up again, we still want to chain these new boxes to the ones from before she went behind those people. So that's exactly where our next tracker comes in. It's called Simple Online Real-Time Tracker, or SORT for short. Now, let's take our previous situation but simplify it down to only one dimension, so it's a little bit cleaner to see. We have our bounding box at time t, and then in the next frame, at time t plus 1, we get another box. Now, in comparison to our IOU tracker from before, SORT starts to keep a motion model of the object while the track is growing. Now, this motion model is based on the Kalman filter, which is a popular and battle-tested prediction technique. It keeps one of these motion models for every track that is active in the video. Based on this motion model, SORT will first generate a prediction of where it thinks the next bounding box will be. Then, when the detection comes in, it looks at the IOU between all the new boxes and all the predicted boxes instead of all previous boxes like we did last time. Now, if the IOU is high enough, the tracker will use a Kalman filter to generate a new box that uses information of both the predicted box and the actual detection. By doing this, we get a sort of smoothing effect resulting in more stable detections. Now for the next frame, we start again by using our Kalman filter. We use it to predict where the next box will be. If the actual detection is missing in this frame, let's say from occlusion, then the tracker will stop there, but it still keeps its prediction in mind. Then for the frame at time t plus 4, the Kalman filter predicts the next box based on its previous prediction, as well as its previously generated motion model. If we then get a detection again that overlaps with our new prediction, we can chain the detection to our track, just like before. This approach works well for objects that move linearly, like cars and people, and does a good job in that case of handling occlusion. However, if the objects have more erratic movements, keep in mind that the motion model is linear, and so will not be able to follow. In that case, it might be better to substitute the Kalman motion tracker with a visual tracker, like KCF, which is done by the VIOU tracker. That brings us to the very popular Deep Sort tracker. As the name suggests, it heavily relies on the sort tracker we talked about before. Let's recap our situation. A detection at time t, and another one at time t plus 1. At this point, DeepSort 2 will use its Kalman filter to make a prediction on the bounding box. It will also calculate the IOUs, just like SORT did. But now we look at one more thing. What is inside these boxes? Let's take the T plus 2 prediction and detection boxes as examples. For simplicity, we'll start with both boxes having the exact same content. DeepSort uses a small, custom-made convolutional neural network to generate what is called a feature vector that describes the contents of the bounding box. The feature vector is no more than a list of numbers, and so in our case we'll start simple and use a vector of size 2. 
we do the same thing for our predicted books as well. Initially, of course, they're gonna be the same, because our boxes contain the same image. Since our size of the vector is 2, we can plot these feature vectors in two dimensions. The idea of a feature vector is that you can train a convolutional neural network in such a way that the distance between their feature vectors is very small if it is the same person and very large if both boxes look nothing alike. Now we use a convolutional neural network to do this because it is very robust and will generate a small difference even if the person in one of the boxes is partially occluded. So now to recap. DeepSort does the exact same thing as Sort, only instead of looking at the IOU between its predicted box and the actual detection, it also looks at the distance between their feature vectors. We use the feature vector of size 2 here, but DeepSort uses one with 128 dimensions. Finally, let's take a look at the state of the art. Some of these trackers can get very exotic, but the recently published Fairmod tracker shows that the approach we learned is still very valid. Fairmod does a lot of cool things under the hood, and I can't focus on all of them in this video, but there are some tweaks that we can take a look at. Until now, we've looked at our object detectors as being a black box. We can feed it an image, and it will spit out a bunch of bounding boxes. Then we calculate our feature vectors with the custom convolutional neural network from before. But if we take a look inside this object detector, we will most likely see three main components. The first, a backbone network, that is responsible for getting as much information out of the image as possible. It learns what to look for while training, and throws away detail we don't need. The output of one of these backbone models is called a feature map. This is basically a large list of the most interesting data or features that the backbone model pulled out of the image. This is our second component. Based on this feature map, the third part of the object detection model will generate the actual locations of the bounding boxes, their respective classes and corresponding scores. How this is done varies greatly from model to model of course, but it's not that important for us right now. Some of you, however, will have already made the connection between this feature map and the feature vectors we talked about before. Fairmod is part of a group of trackers called Single Shot Trackers, instead of the two-part trackers like DeepSort. DeepSort first runs its object detector and then a custom convolutional neural network to get the feature vectors. These one-shot trackers realized that a lot of the same operations in this convolutional neural network are actually already done by the object detector's backbone. So they tweak the object detector itself to not only output bounding boxes, but also the feature vector we talked about before. Essentially reusing the outputs of a lot of big computations to make the whole thing a lot more efficient. Because we now generate the feature vector straight from the object detector's backbone, it's not only more efficient, but we can tweak the model even more to generate larger and much better feature vectors. Once we have both the bounding boxes and the feature vectors of each box, we can then use the exact same method as in DeepSort, like we saw earlier, to get our final tracker. Hi, this is Victor from ML6, a Belgian machine learning company. Hopefully you've had as much fun in learning about object tracking as I had in actually making the video. Because there's a lot more to come. We're going deep into the code of each of these trackers in an upcoming video. And of course, there's a lot more fields in machine learning left to cover. So see you in the next video from ML6.